thank you very, very much for having me. And uh, yes, my topic is, uh, is going to be uh, uh, this one. Uh, I read again the title, New Trade Protection is uh, Around the World, uh, Economics, Economic and Geopolitical Implication. I, I will stay mainly uh, on the economic one. I will have uh, some uh, provocation on the geopolitical one. Uh, I'm not an expert of uh, geopolitical issues. Um, so, uh, uh, I, um, my first part of the presentation uh, will be uh, have a uh, historical background. So, I, I would like uh, to remind uh, everybody uh, what, what we have done up to now uh, before entering to the uh, describing um, uh, the current problems. Um, so, one term that I might use to introduce uh, the economic environment uh, around us is the term of globalization, which is highly utilized. Uh, it has many dimensions, obviously. Uh, we don't not only have economic uh, globalization, we have the political one, the cultural one, the military one, and many others. Here with you, I will focus mainly on the economic one. And uh, uh, globalization means an increasing integration of uh, uh, country uh, and from economic point of view of markets. In the background, as you can see, uh, I have uh, uh, Asia and uh, the Silk Road. Uh, so that, that tell us about something uh, uh, about the uh, very old uh, uh, experiment of globalization that happened uh, centuries ago. I will not cover this. I will stay within the uh, uh, two last hundred years. Uh, but just to remind that uh, in, in the history, we had uh, small phases uh, of globalization as well, not as important uh, from a quantitative point of view as uh, the one we have now, but we had some of those. Uh, okay, with this um, nice graph I have uh, drawn by uh, Doug Irwin, an American colleague and economist, um, I described the evolution of uh, uh, one aspect of globalization that I take as a, as a summary of all aspects of economic globalization, which is the trade openness index for the world uh, going from 1870 to today. Um, and trade openness is simply the, the ratio between export plus import divided by GDP of the world. Um, as you can see from the line, um, uh, we had a first phase of globalization starting in 1870 that uh, abruptly uh, went down after, a second, after the First World War and especially uh, um, during and after the Great Depression uh, of the 29, uh, reached a minimum in 1945 and, the, and then we have what has happened uh, nowadays. As you can see, uh, uh, we have uh, 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 the last period after the Second World War can be divided in sub-periods, but this is not what is important for me now. Um, what is important is to highlight that uh, uh, after the uh, Great Recession of 2008-2007, um, uh, we start considering now that we have initiated a new period. Uh, globalization stopped growing or, or stop growing as fast as uh, it was uh, before. And we started a period of uh, either um, static evolution of uh, um, globalization from the trade point of view or reduction of globalization. The Economist, the magazine, has named this type of period as slow balization. And uh, this is uh, the part on which I will focus my attention with you. Um, Um, the fundamental driver of globalization uh, after the Second World War uh, has been first, and this is very important, the creation of some uh, uh, institution. Um, and for us, the institution important are firstly the GATT, which was not real an institution, but was simply an agreement. And then the WTO, who is now around the GATT and is a proper institution. And uh, this institution uh, were created um, uh, to, to organize the international environment on a rule-based system. This is the key point, one of the key points uh, for us today. Um, uh, who did this? Well, uh, the two 
winning countries of the Second World War on the capitalist side, the United Kingdom and the United States of America met in a nice location on the American West Coast, uh, East Coast, in New England, New Hampshire, Bretton Woods. And uh, um, the aim of that meeting was to create institution that were the, the should have got, uh, should have reduced the probability of having such a nasty trade and financial war that happened uh, during and after the Great Depression between the United States and European countries. Uh, this was the real aim and uh, um, the idea was to create a rule-based system. On the trade side, GATT was created and worked very well as we will see in a minute. Uh, the other uh, important driver of uh, globalization is innovation. This is not new. Also back in 1800, in uh, 1800, yes, uh, innovation was uh, one of the core elements of uh, economic growth and globalization. Um, and uh, uh, um, innovation, attention, doesn't mean simply technological innovation. Obviously, it is mainly technological innovation, but just give you an example of an innovation which has nothing to do with technology which was so important for international trade. Between the end of the 50s and beginning of the 60s in the, in the United States, an entrepreneur invented uh, um, the container, a standardized metallic box, which should have been used to transport goods around the world. He started using it in his own company. He started to uh, lobbying the American government to, do, to introduce it as a standard for all uh, transport in the US, uh, receiving uh, a big opposition by many competitors because they thought he had uh, a first mover advantage. Uh, but when he was able to convince the American, the US government to introduce it, it was a huge success. At the beginning of the 60s, uh, this, uh, the container became a standard in the US and obviously, uh, especially at that time, uh, if you wanted to trade with the US, you had to utilize the container and then it became a standard all over the world. This was a, an incredible innovation, nothing to do with technology, who impacted uh, incredibly to, uh, on uh, uh, international trade and globalization. Obviously, most other innovation, I'm not entering into the, discussing this issue, uh, have a technological feature. The most recent one uh, are um, uh, technological, obviously. Um, what has been the economic performance of, the, of uh, globalization? Well, it's been a fantastic economic performance. Globalization uh, played jointly with an economic system, uh, which is typically called the capitalist economic system, um, which has produced a period of sustained economic growth, which has never be, uh, been experienced before by humans. I will show you uh, 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 some data in a minute. Um, so the last 200 years, uh, we've been used to a continuous and constant uh, economic growth. This was not common uh, before. Uh, it is true that in the last 200 years, not only the capitalist system produced growth. There has been a period uh, in the Soviet Union where another economic system, the communist economic system, worked quite well under Joseph Stalin. Uh, the Soviet Union had a fantastic economic growth from the point of view of material growth. And um, so also the capitalist system, the communist system for a period was able to work. But as predicted by many economists, uh, such a centrally planned uh, system cannot work for a long period. There have been many economists in the 30s and the 40s and later predicting the collapse of the Soviet Union. And in fact, Soviet Union collapsed. And uh, um, if, if you remind uh, if you, uh, your uh, life history, uh, you go back uh, 35 years ago, three fifths of the world population was run by uh, a, co a communist economic system. Nowadays, almost uh, no country is run by a communist economic system. I might cite the very sad North Korea and very happy Cuba as an example, but I don't probably, I would not find any other country using the communist economic system. The capitalist economic system has been utilized everywhere. Even in 
some countries that nowadays call them uh, communist, China, uh, Vietnam, they utilize uh, uh, the capitalist system. This capitalist system is very interesting because it's very flexible. It can work with different uh, type of political system. Probably, and I think it is like this, uh, it works at best with a liberal democratic system, but it can work very well with dictatorship, left-wing dictatorship, China is an example, North Korea is another one, or right-wing dictatorship, uh, uh, a fascist dictatorship in South America uh, went very well uh, on the economic side in Chile under Pinochet. Uh, Pinochet was a, a, a nasty dictator, but from an economic point of view, if you look at the performance of the uh, Chilean economy, it's much better than uh, all the other South American countries in the 70s. Uh, some, some other uh, South American countries also run by a fascist dictatorship like Argentina they weren't able to run uh, the, uh, the economy. So the, this capitalist system is quite flexible, adapt to different cultural and political context. But let's see the, uh, the, the fantastic impact. I show you this graph, which is taken from the Madison Project database. The graph has been done by this very nice um, website, which is called Our World in Data. Um, Madison was, uh, unfortunately he died recently, he was a Scottish economic historian teaching in Denmark and collaborating a lot with the OECD uh, Research Center in Paris. Um, you, in this graph you, you see on the horizontal axis uh, years. Uh, this graph starts from, uh, is a sort of, as a Christian metric if you want, start from year one which is uh, uh, the, uh, year one after the birth of Jesus Christ, uh, up to now. You see the line uh, and uh, on the vertical axis, sorry, is GDP per capita. Uh, GDP per capita calculated in a special way so that uh, uh, over time and cross country comparison are, um, can be done. And uh, GDP per capita, as you know, is GDP of a country divided by population, uh, is a very synthetic measure of well being. It's not the only one, it's not perfect, but as a single uh, measure, it's, it's a decent one. And you can, can see from the graph, uh, you see that from year one, approximately to uh, 1800, uh, 1820 to 130, uh, this line apparently is uh, horizontal, flat. It's not really horizontal because uh, uh, if we zoom on a specific period, we will show we will see this line moving, but given the fantastic explosion, exponential explosion in the last period, uh, it seems uh, flat. And this is the explosion in the last period. I, I presented you a bunch of countries, how the evolution of GDP per capita of these countries has increased. There is another, another table who does the average for the world, and you would see a, a pattern very similar, very flat up to 1820, then 1820 is the period of the British Industrial Revolution, and then uh, a big uh, increase. And this increase has happened thanks to the capitalist economic system who has been playing uh, with uh, uh, globalization. In the first period, this economic growth uh, was uh, mainly restrained to Europe, United States, eventually Japan, Australia, New Zealand, uh, but after the Second War, and especially after the 80s, uh, this economic growth spread all over the world. Uh, if you look at Asia, South Asia, East Asia, this is a clear example, but partially also South America, and also some part of Africa, especially in the last 20 years. Um, so this is uh, one a big example of the performance. The other measure of performance I want to uh, highlight, uh, obviously I've just taken up uh, two uh, different measures um, as a synthesis of the performance is extreme poverty. In 1820, more than 80% of the world population was in, con in condition of extreme poverty. Here, extreme poverty uh, is defined as a, a person living with less than $1.9 per day in purchasing power parity. Again, this measurement allow 
over time comparison and cross country comparison. Um, so in 1820, uh, more than 80%. Nowadays, in 2015, we, uh, the, the year for which we have the last reliable data, uh, down to 10%. And the picture showed you the evolution of the absolute number of uh, uh, war poor. Uh, between 1990 and, uh, and 2015, with a prediction to 2030. As you can see, in the last 25 years, um, world extreme poor has gone down by more than 1 billion. This is an incredible result, and this is due only to economic growth. A very important result. So I'm just, I'm very apologetic of what uh, we have done from this point of view. Uh, obviously, there are not all roses. Uh, there are many other problems around the world. Um, two of the key problems, at least from my point of view, one is inequality. Inequality around the world has gone down cross country, but it has increased within countries. And it has increased within countries in developed countries and in, under the, uh, in the less developed countries. And uh, it has increased strongly in the last uh, 30 years in the United States, in some European countries, in Brazil, in China, in India. And uh, uh, this is a problem. Um, from my point of view, I don't think, uh, I don't see it as an ethical or moral problem based on my ethical values. It is a mainly problem of uh, working of our uh, economies and uh, societies. Uh, it has been shown by many models that too much inequality is bad for economic growth. The capitalist system need a very strong middle class. This is very important for the capitalist system to work well. In addition to this, from a political point of view, we've seen that if we don't take into consideration inequality in our uh, policies and we uh, leave behind part of our society, then we will have a backlash. And this is what has happened in the last 10 years in many countries. The so-called populist backlash is uh, partly due to uh, the fact that inequality in the last 20 years have not been tackled in most of our countries. And uh, I'm not going to enter here, but uh, uh, inequality, what has caused inequality? Well, partly globalization, yes. Um, uh, uh, General uh, Ristuccia was citing trade theories and trade theories tell us that uh, opening of trade is good for countries, but within country, this can create uh, increasing inequality. And this has happened. But nearby inequality, obviously, there, are, there is a, a big other actor generating inequality, which is technology. Technology always has generated uh, inequality problem. Remember during the Industrial Revolution, there was uh, in England, there was uh, the new textile machinery entering the plants. And this, these machinery were substituting men. This was innovation, was technology. And this is created immediately a big protest. The Luddites uh, were a revolutionary uh, movement who were entering plants, destroying this machinery. So the, um, nothing new. Uh, and also technology is creating inequality nowadays. We know this, what we, also we economists, we have underplayed the role of inequality. This is one. And the other uh, big major problem is uh, uh, that human activities have contributed in a significant way to the global warming problem uh, for the very reason that uh, the last 100 years has been a fantastic success from an economic point of view. The capitalist engine needs a lot of resources and uh, create a lot of pollution. And uh, we have underplayed this problem in the past and now we have this big problem and we have to tackle this. So I was apologetic, but obviously we have big problem. But uh, let's come to uh, the more recent uh, experience. Some of the elements uh, I'm going to highlight have been all already uh, underlined by General Restuccia. 
Greece Lucha, sorry. Um, so a key point for us is the Great Recession of 2008-2010. I think it, can, it will be considered a, a historic turning point. Obviously, some changes were already happening before, but uh, uh, if you remember, international trading goods and services, this was shown also in the graph I presented to you at the beginning, um, has stopped growing uh, more than GDP. For all the period after the Second World War, international trade has been growing more than GDP. After 2008, 2010, this has stopped growing more. In some years, it's grown more, but on average, has not grown more. And actually, in 2019, before the, uh, the, the pandemics, uh, the trade volume around the world fell. Okay, so what's going on? There are many factors. Uh, I tend to concentrate only on economic factors, and these four economic factors are not independent one from the other. They are all uh, interlinked. I will go through them uh, in turn. The first one is the existence of global supply chain that have stopped growing. The second one is China that is been rebalancing its growth model. The third one is the new role of the United States who changed uh, its role uh, around the world, moving towards protectionism. And uh, the, the fourth one is the populist era in many other countries uh, beyond the United States uh, that have started adopting discriminatory measure. Let me go through each one of these. Uh, I start with this graph. Uh, so what are global value chain? Well, it's a, a sort of new way, not completely new, but uh, new in terms of its dimension and spread of organizing the production process. Uh, yeah. If we go back 60 years, maybe less, most of the product were produced within a country from the raw material, probably imported, uh, to the final good. All the stages of production were happening within the country. More and more, uh, the organization of the production proce process has been fragmented internationally. Uh, following what uh, General Aristotle was saying, the principle of comparative advantage. Uh, uh, the production of a product is composed by many phases of production. Uh, some country might have a comparative advantage in producing the first phase, another one the second phase. And progressively, thanks to technology, thanks to reduction in trade cost, um, and thanks to trade liberalization, firms have been optimizing their um, uh, location of production around the world, creating in this way global value chain. Global value, ch value chain is composed by many companies producing different parts of the production process in different countries in the world. And as you can see from this measure taken from the last report of the World Bank, this is a synthetic measure. This is the share of global value chain on total trade. Global value chain trade on total uh, global trade. As you can see in the 70s, it was not so small, it was already bigger than 35%. It went up to more than 50% at the uh, moment of the Great Recession, and that started going down. This is one of the key points of uh, the evolution in the last few years. Why? Uh, well, uh, this international fragmentation of production process uh, in contributed to the increase in international integration, obviously, and the reduction is due to many factors. Well, one is the fact that after the Great Recession, uh, world uh, average economic growth has become lower than before. This was a process that already started before the Great Recession. China started reducing its economic growth uh, even before the Great Recession. It's natural. China has been growing for more than 10% on average uh, for more than 30 years. This is an incredible economic miracle. Never happened before. And the country cannot grow forever at that level. It, it was expected that, the, that China was going to reduce uh, its economic growth. Um, the second factor is that the location has become le less relatively convenient. 
uh, wages uh, in China have increased. So the gap and the convenience of moving production in China have reduced over time. Uh, there were some other countries, obviously. Um, logistic, uh, history of logistics showed that uh, at the beginning of the uh, uh, delocation, outsourcing uh, period, uh, many companies underplayed the key role of logistic and the cost of logistic took more, uh, a bigger role in the company decision. And the other fact is China, again, uh, China has become more inward oriented. And this is natural as was saying, um, the China economic growth was too biased uh, toward export. And it is uh, uh, unhealthy for a country to have for a long period such an economic growth. Uh, the Chinese government with its economic plan realized this and they, start, uh, they started reducing the dependence on um, international markets. Uh, one uh, measure is written here. In the 90s, the share of intermediate imports contained in Chinese export was about 50%. Now is down to, in 2015, was down to 30%. Um, uh, this graph is nice because there are a lot of colors. <laughs> it's quite complicated to to understand, this is based on a network analysis done by SIM economists at the WTO. Actually, it's not only the WTO, it's a joint venture between WTO, OECD, and some other international institution. This is run actually by a, a bunch of uh, Chinese and Japanese economists. Um, a, um, on the left graph, we have uh, a typical complex uh, global value chain network. On the right hand side, you have a traditional uh, trade network. Uh, each bowl is a country. The dimension of each bowl is the participation of a country into a global value chain or into a trade network. Um, as you can see, in both traditional trade network and global value chain network, there are three major countries who regionalize trade around the world. One is the United States, there's one is China, and the other one is Germany. Around it, there are region, mainly regional countries. Uh, the only big difference between the two uh, graphs that I want to uh, highlight, because this will be utilized by me later to say a few words about the coronavirus shock, uh, is that on the right hand side, you see a uh, arrows linking Germany to China, linking uh, China to the United States on the traditional network. On the left hand side, you don't see arrows linking Germany to China and China to the United States. This is a major difference. This is to say that global value chain are mainly, not completely, but mainly regionalized. So a shock happening in the global value chain in Germany has a big consequence in the regional area, not much in the other two regional um, area. Uh, one, let me allow me to say, run by China, and the other one run by the United States. I will come back to this issue, issue uh, uh, later on. Now, uh, the second element. Uh, I already uh, said something about this, so I will... Uh, um, spend uh, only a few minutes here. China, obviously, one should spend a lot of time on China because China uh, has a lot of problem and uh, is one of the key player uh, that uh, also has caused many of the events that have happened uh, recently. Um, uh, this is the evolution. Uh, China is less dependent on export. Uh, it has started rebalancing its economy. A merchandise export as a share of Chinese GDP in 2008 were 31%. In a little bit more than 10 years, now is down to 17%. This is not that China has become a close country. No, it's just simply rebalancing. Uh, let me take another example of a country who has been for a very long period too much biased towards export, Germany. Germany, after the second half of the 90s, Germany have been a country 
uh, incredibly um, uh, biased toward expert because German companies were very good that everybody wants to buy from them. But this, from a macroeconomic point of view, creates imbalances, create imbalances for Germany itself. So it is not healthy for Germany to keep on having such an unbalanced economy who grows much more for external uh, uh, element than for, than for domestic one. And since Germany is within the European Union and this is within, within the Euro area, this is creating problem for other countries in the Euro area. So this is why the German have to rebalance their economy for internal motivation and for their uh, participation to the, to the Euro. And now let me come and I will spend a few minutes here on, uh, on what I think has been the major event that happened after uh, 2008, which is the big change of uh, stance that the United States had with the new presidency by, uh, presidency by President Trump. Um, synthetically, uh, I wrote that the United States adopted an American first policy. This has been a major turning point. Uh, the United States of America have been the leader of the free trade approach based on the multilateral approach, which was, as we have already seen, a rule-based approach. Rule-based approach means that there are some rules set by the GATT and the WTO, and that all countries, small and big, follow this rule, with some deviation, obviously. There have been many deviations, by big countries, European Union, the United States, China, India, and small, uh, small countries, but always uh, at the end, going back to the rule. I just remind you, George W. Bush, when first time he was elected, he raised immediately after three months of election, he raised tariff on steel to protect some steel producer uh, in the state. He was playing uh, using uh, an exception within the WTO rules, that you are allowed for safeguard measures if some uh, event ha has happened uh, to protect uh, on a temporary basis um, your companies. He introduced the tariff. He played with the WTO saying that those exceptions were valid for the United States case. European Union, Japan, South Korea protested within the, uh, the WTO. And the WTO opened up a panel and the panel said to the United States, no, you're not in line with the rule of the WTO because what you said has happened in the United States has not happened. After a few days, George W. Bush eliminated the tariff. So the role of the WTO was uh, respected by the United States of America. I've utilized an example of America. Obviously, I would have a huge amount of example by many other countries. But I utilize an example of America saying that this is not, now it's different. Uh, the, uh, President Donald Trump has started a new era of protectionism. Uh, here is just some action that he did when he was elected in the last two years. He introduced initially tariffs on steel and aluminium imports for, for national security reason. National security is a clause within the WTO that allow a country to introduce tariff and uh, if it is said that it is for national security, the country cannot be questioned. Obviously, this is a, a, a clause that should be utilized only in real national security situation. It has been clear to all commentators that even if the United States were in line with the letter of the law, the United States were violating the spirit of the provision. If now all countries started using national security clause with the same way, we will go back to a terrible protectionist period. And unfortunately, recently, South Korea and Japan, one against the other on high-tech product, issued for the first time, from their point of view, a national security um, motivation to raise a barrier to trade between South Korea and Japan on high-tech. Well, the second one, obviously, is the trade war with China. Now we have ended with phase one. They reached a sort of agreement, but tariff remain in place. 
there's no being changed in tariff. And the other very important element on my side uh, is that the United States, and uh, remember the United States are the country to, together with the United Kingdom, who have been the big sponsors of the GATT and the WTO since the beginning and during the process. If you want, European countries uh, have been at the beginning a little bit slow to go on, uh, on the trade liberalization path. And the, the United States of America was the leader on this uh, trade liberalization path, dragging all the other countries on it. And now there has been a big change. Not only uh, an easy use of some clauses of the WTO, uh, also the United States have blocked the reappointment of the WTO appellate body um, of the judges. Uh, what is the appellate body within WTO? WTO has a judicial system. It's called the dispute and settlement mechanism. Within it, there is a, a, a judicial uh, uh, organ, which is the appellate body, which is composed by usually seven judges. By <clears throat> creation, the appellate body cannot work with less than three judges. The United States, for the last few years, have been uh, um, blocking the appointment of the judges. So that last December, because many judges retired, remain only one judge. So in this moment, such an important element of the judicial system of the WTO cannot work. Obviously, the United States have motivation to do this. Uh, the appellate body was not working well. Uh, but my question is, is this the way to solve this um, this, uh, uh, this problem? Uh, isn't this way, this, way, uh, this way of approaching the problem worse than a possible solution? Uh, the problem from, of this approach for the, for the world is that this U.S. new approach has increased uncertainty around the world. Uh, and uncertainty, business don't like uncertainty. In terms of foreign direct investment, in terms of trade, if there is a huge amount of uncertainty, uh, companies stop trading, stop making foreign direct investment. What will be the next action of the Americans? Um, okay. Um, let me say that not, by now we have a lot of uh, empirical academic paper who have analyzed the impact of the trade war on the US and the rest of the world. Uh, two years are past, we have a lot of them. And as trade, trade theory uh, suggests us, uh, this empirical analysis has confirmed trade theory. Uh, a trade war is not easy to win. A trade war generates losses for both sides. We know it from history. The great the, the trade war that uh, happened during the, the Great Depression between the United States and European country was a loss-loss uh, action on both sides of the uh, Atlantic Ocean. More jobs were destroyed than jobs were created. Uh, so what, happened, what, uh, what emerged from this empirical result? Well, one result is, uh, in line with what uh, probably you, the United States government wanted to obtain. The Chinese economy has been seriously hit by the tariff. Yes, they have. However, there have been substantial costs for the U.S. economy. As expected from theory, U.S. exporters are not only hurt by Chinese tariff, the retaliation by the Chinese, but also by the U.S. tariff on Chinese intermediate products that reduce their competitiveness. Companies who have to buy uh, aluminum and steel, they have to buy in, in the US, they have to buy it at a higher price because of the tariff. And uh, they, these results tell us that US consumer is paying for the tariff. Donald Trump at a certain point said that uh, the Chinese exporter will pay for the tariff. This theoretically is possible because the, the United States is a big country and uh, theory tell us that a, a big country imposing a tariff can have such a power uh, 
uh, through market demand and supply, that the foreign exporter will reduce its, uh, its uh, international price by the same amount of the tariff. In this case, the domestic price in the United States would have not increased. The Chinese exporter would have paid for the tariff, reducing their uh, profit. This has not happened in the United States. Um, uh, prices have increased in the United States. Moreover, and this is the problem for us European, third countries might ha have to pay a cost. Not only a cost, might, might have benefits. There are some results in the empirical literature that the trade war between the uh, uh, United States and China in some sector might have created benefits for European competitors. So let's make European Union great again. But uh, for example, one of the agreement in phase one uh, between the Chinese government and the United States government is the commitment by the Chinese to buy more U.S. good. Uh, we call it managed trade. And managed trade generate cost, diversion costs for third countries. Probably the increase in uh, uh, buy, uh, uh, the Chinese will increase uh, the uh, buying uh, American products at the expense of European products, uh, Asia, other Asian country products, and so on. Um, what's the time? I, uh, may I go for three, four minutes? I have time? Yes, sir, you have time. Thank yes, you. Um, oh, sorry. OK, uh, the, 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 this graph. Uh, oh, la Okay, this graph show um, how difficult it is to generate trade policy, to introduce a tariff nowadays in an era of a global value chain. Uh, an initial tariff on inputs, uh, since uh, you have to imagine the global value chain as companies producing a certain part of a product located in different countries. You can imagine that if a country, say the United States, put uh, um, a tariff on uh, steel and aluminum, an input to the production process, this will increase the cost for American producer of uh, uh, an intermediate product using aluminum and steel. And uh, this it will have uh, a, a magnified effect on the price of intermediate products and finally on the price of the uh, final product to the consumer. This will be magnified even more if on intermediate products and final product, there are in some other countries, not necessarily the United States, additional tariff. So for in this table, you see that for different sector, how the accumulation of various tariff during the production process might have an impact on the final product. In this uh, example, uh, at, um, this is a document, recent document by the OECD. They uh, simulated that in the textile sector, a small tariff of uh, less than 0.5% of intermediate products accumulated with the other on, on inputs, accumulated on other tariff, might end up with a, a tariff on the uh, effective tariff on the final product almost of 7%. So it's quite complicated nowadays to utilize trade policy without hurting domestic companies. Okay. Obviously, not, there are some nice signal. Uh, for me, a nice signal is what has happened in mid-January. In mid-January, uh, the United States, the European Union, and Japan uh, signed a joint statement who was delivered to the WTO, asking the WTO to have tougher rule on government subsidy. Obviously here the target is China. Uh, China uh, um, uh, companies are too much subsidized by the government. Um, and this is uh, uh, unfair from a competitiveness point of view for many other countries, for firms who cannot be subsidized. Um, and so the importance of this joint statement is that the two big player, United States, EU, Japan, decided to 
utilize the WTO with a joint statement. If something's very small, small obviously, because for the moment there has been no, no result of this, but is, for me is a signal that the United States, in the United States, there is still uh, willingness to play within a rule-based system run by the WTO. Okay, and the last point of the four I have uh, presented before is that uh, not only the United States and China uh, started uh, creating a trade, a trade war or retaliation of the European Union against uh, United States tariff, but all over the world, 2018-2019 uh, have been a, a period in which discriminatory measure, and discriminatory measure means uh, trade barriers beyond tariffs have increased. Um, there is this uh, document which is uh, run by, oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, which is run uh, by, at the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland by Evenet and Fritz, which is a, um, every few months give a picture of uh, trade protection around the world. You can see very clearly that in 2018, 2019, the number of discriminatory uh, commercial policy, meaning, meaning protection intervention has increased a lot. So there is a tendency to increase protection all over the world. And out of these uh, um, two years, uh, US and China accounted for only 23% of the new protectionist measure. So all other protectionist measures have been raised by many other countries. And finally, I'm going to close quickly on, uh, on the COVID shock. Uh, the pandemics plus the containment policy uh, generates both the supply and the demand shock. The supply shock is due to the lockdowns that reduce or stop productions. The demand shock uh, is due to the impact of the recession on aggregate dem demand on, uh, through the reduction of income of, uh, of, the, uh, of the consumer. Um, there will be also an economic contagion, probably across uh, countries, but due to the uh, network graph I showed before, uh, since global value chain uh, are very regionalized, probably the supply shock will be mostly regional. And uh, uh, the forecast for the WTO in terms of the collapse of trade is that it will be larger than the Great Recession. This is the, the forecast. This graph is taken directly from them. As you can see, uh, there are, uh, the blue line is the real evolution. The uh, green dotted line is the, uh, the, the trend uh, uh, without the Great Recession, how trade would have evolved without the Great Recession. Here is the, the great trade collapse during the Great Recession. Then it uh, went up again. Um, and then here, uh, the three scenarios. Well, the nothing has happened scenario is the uh, uh, yellow dotted line. Then there is the optimistic scenario, a small drop, and there is the pessimistic scenario. As you can see, both the optimistic scenario and the uh, pessimistic scenario are uh, worse than the drop in export during the um, Great Recession. Therefore, and here I'm closing. Uh, overall, we have a very weak uh, international economic environment. And unfortunately, this couples with uh, weaker actors. Uh, European Union has unfortunately Brexit, plus uh, the COVID-19 uh, 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 pandemics has clearly exposed international division among European Union countries in terms of response. So I think uh, European Union is very weak in this moment internally. Obviously, it might come out even stronger or I, li I let you imagine. Um, in the United States, uh, the United States, uh, it has inside unprecedented internal, internal divides. We will have the election next November. We will see what's happened. Uh, but obviously also the United States is clearly weakened and China is weakened. Uh, China 
uh, has a social contract inside the, inside, uh, the country. Uh, the fantastic economic growth has allowed persons to concentrate on income and not concentrating on their willingness to be free to speak and to, to do uh, things that uh, people in other countries might do. Somebody says the Chinese are different. I'm not sure. And uh, these, uh, fa the fact that uh, economic growth for natural economic motivation has been reduced. But uh, on this reduction of economic growth, there have been two additional shock which artificially strengthen the reduction. One is a trade war, which is, is hitting the Chinese economy strongly. And the other one is the pandemics. Uh, probably the pandemics will reduce the presence of many companies in, in China. Um, and this will, the question is, will the social contract resist? Thank you for listening. <laughs>